Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> okay. God has given me the grace uh, to be here today, this week. Uh, he shed a special grace uh, for me and my family. And um, the reason is that because my mom passed away, and I didn't think I would be able to have the strength to be up here today to share God's word with you. However, our living God gave me the strength and the courage uh, to prepare and um, uh, to preach his word, despite the fact that my mom passed away. And I'm very grateful to him because she uh, was a believer and she is uh, before his presence right now. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, she did suffer some physical pain. And so now, as the Bible says, no more pain, no more suffering. And so I'm very grateful for that. And just again, the realization that we're here to worship God because eternal life does matter. Now, just as someone is born, someone is going to die. That, that's a fact. And, and so where that person goes is ultimately up to the Lord and that individual. And so I'm just grateful that my mom is in the presence of God. And so thank you for allowing me to share that this morning. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, again, the, our living God um, is the reason why I'm here today. And I'm here on a weekly basis by His grace. Now, we're going to continue the study of the uh, book of Galatians. We've been looking at this uh, wonderful book. We saw that last week that the gospel was a divine revelation from God. It was not originated from man in at, at all, but it originated from the Lord himself. And then secondly, we saw that the gospel changed lives last week. And this week, as we cover chapter 2, we're going to look at how we are free in Christ because of the gospel. And we are also going to see that we are justified by faith. Faith alone in Christ. That's it. And so those are the two points. We are free in Christ and we are justified by faith. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we are grateful for you. We are grateful for who you are. We thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness to us. We're grateful for our Savior who has given us hope, who has given us eternal life. He has shed his blood for us. He died so that we could have life, so that we could be free in him. And so, Lord, as we look to you in prayer and in your word, we ask that you would minister to our hearts, encourage our hearts, and help us to know that you are the reason for our existence and for our living. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our, our text comes from Galatians 2. I shall read from the New American Standard Version. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who are of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subject to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were uh, makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But in the, on the contrary, seeing that I have been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectively worked for Peter, in him his apostleship to the circumcised effectively worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputable to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. 
so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. I'm going to pause there for now and just kind of unpack this a little bit. We see from this text that Apostle Paul continues to address the people at Galatia for the revelation that God has given Paul. And this revelation is the gospel, gospel plus nothing. And he is now living out this gospel. Paul was called to the Gentiles, to the people who were not given the law, which were the Jews. And Titus, and he mentions Titus here because Titus was a Gentile. Um, and as you know, the Jews, the Jewish men had to go through certain ceremonial um, law at, at the eighth day of their birth, after the eighth day, to be circumcised, and that was part of being a Jew. And Paul here specifically mentions that in Christ, you are free. You're not bound by the law. Titus specifically, he mentions, is a Gentile and who, who ministered with Paul and Paul said Titus chose, and Paul chose Titus not to be conformed to the Jewish rite of circumcision. And that is huge because that testified that Titus was saved not by works, but by the grace of God, by faith alone. And that is what Paul is addressing here. And so we can see that our lives in Christ are free. Paul is demonstrating this through uh, Titus, who was free in Christ and was not bound by the law as the Jewish people would like uh, for people to, to, to be bound by. And so there is no pressure here. Yes, there is some pressure by the, um, the Jewish leaders as well as the Jewish people, but Paul resisted that pressure. Why? Because he knew that the gospel that he was preaching for the Gentiles, that that gospel was given to him by God. A re revelation to Paul by God. And, and so that's where Paul's liberty was. And that's where Timothy's liberty was. That freedom to live a life without being bondage to the law of any kind. You know, I failed a class in seminary because I could not keep the letter of the law. My last year in seminary, one of my last classes, last semester, I had to take this class and uh, I had to pass this class to graduate. And uh, I, told the pa I told the seminary professor that uh, I would have a hard time making class on time because I was coming from Virginia and the class was in Maryland. 45 minutes to 50 minutes without traffic, but an hour and a half in the morning. My class was in the morning. The seminary had a policy. If you're late three, uh, if, you are, if you have three absences, you automatically fail the class. Regardless of how well you do academically, you fail the class. So three absences, you fail. Three tardies equals one absence. So I knew that I was going to have problems, not because I wasn't diligent. I left my house like around 6.30, um, 6.45 the latest for that 8 o'clock class. And I told my professor that I will uh, be diligent to make it on time, but there will be times when there will be accidents on 4.95, um, there will be some things that I cannot control. And he acknowledged. And he said, okay, I'll get, give that consideration. So I thought, okay, um, I'm going to be all right. Well, this class, I did not, I wasn't absent any particular day at all, but I was tardy a number of days. And sometimes I was I just made it into the door. The professor just called my name, just a couple names before I could see here. He was calling people's names. So I thought, while well, he saw me come in, surely he's going to mark me present. This happened maybe two or three times. 
And there were other times where he just closed the book and I entered the class. And then there were maybe one time where he, was, he started his lecture. He starts right on time, right at eight. So I, maybe I was a minute late or something. But all these times, I just missed his reckoning of uh, the time that I should have been there. So in my mind, I was thinking at least I have, uh, I didn't miss any days and that um, I shouldn't fail because there were a couple times that he was calling the names and I just entered. And so I thought, surely he has me marked down. But at the end of the semester, I get an F. And I'm like, why did I get an F? Uh, I went into the class, I knew I had at least a B plus. So academically, I knew I was okay. But it turned out I got an F because I missed too many classes. And I said to myself, wait a minute, something wrong with this picture. I, I spent, you know, um, I worked full time, was in ministry, was married in seminary. Uh, and I, um, and that, at that time I had um, one child, maybe two, second one's on the way. And I'm thinking, full-time graduate school and I, I put in so much effort and here I'm going to fail a class not because I wasn't academically diligent but because I missed or I was tardy in class which I, I've worked very hard for and so the whole thing just blew me away and, and I didn't know what to do initially but I just knew that uh, my spirit said something is wrong with this um, so I appealed to the dean of the seminary. I wrote him a letter. I said, yes, I missed the letter of the law, but I kept the spirit of the law. And what is the purpose of the attendance policy? It, I felt that the purpose of the attendance policy was that, so that the people would not just arbitrarily miss. And, and I knew that I wouldn't be doing that. And I also, in this letter, said that I spoke to the professor and he acknowledged that I might be late. And, and yet I still failed. And so here, according to the letter of the law, I fa failed the class. And if I, if my salvation is based on the letter of the, uh, the law, definitely, I, if I fail a class, I'm gonna not make it to heaven. Uh, so I am very grateful for um, the liberty that Christ gives us. Yes, the law is there and the law needs to be upheld. But none of us can do it. And that's what Galatians talks about. And we'll see a little bit later that we're justified by faith. And Romans talks about that. Romans tells us that we're not saved by keeping the law because none of us can. And so, by the way, I did fail, uh, no, passed the class. The dean overruled that uh, verdict. So, by the grace of God, I passed. And you know, when I graduated, the same professor who failed me said, congratulations. And so I didn't know how to respond to him personally. But, <laughs> but I'm so thankful that we have freedom in Christ because Christ fulfilled the law and that we have the opportunity to live a life unshackled. All things are permissible, God says, but not all things are profitable. But let me qualify that, all things moral. When the Bible says all things are permissible, all things are allowed, that doesn't mean that we can go do our sins because there's a contradiction there. Of course, the, the premise is that within the law, within God's rules, within the moral laws, all things are possible. And not all things are obviously profitable. So, you know, the, some are amoral things, like color the socks. I had to choose what color of socks I was gonna wear today. You know, wearing black socks, white socks, you know, it doesn't matter. So, we're free in many ways. But in some churches, you know, they say, well, you can't wear black socks on certain days, or you can't do this on certain times, you can't do that, or you can't sit on this side, you can't sit on that side, or you can't sing this hymn, you can't, you know, there are a lot of churches like that. They shackle you. And this is what's happening in the first century here. And we see that 
You know, the gospel was given to not only the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Look at verses 7 and 8. We'll see that the same gospel is given to two different groups. But on the contrary, seeing that I have been entrusted the gospel to the uncircumcised, those are non-Jews, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectively worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectively worked for me also to the Gentiles. So the Jews and the Gentiles are saved the same way, the same gospel. The just shall live by faith. You see, it's the same message to two different groups. So there is freedom here. You see, and you know, as we see in the text here that God gives us liberty and you know, those who were not of this mindset, they sent spies to spy out on, Pete, or on Paul and to see how he lives his life. Verse 4, but it was because of the false brethren, the false, you see, not the true, false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. So the sole purpose of these false brethren, the sole purpose of these guys were to point the finger at the ones who were free to say, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You ought to do this. You ought to do that. The text says, for the purpose of bringing them into bondage, to shackle their life. The book of Galatians is about freedom by the grace of God. So we are free in Christ. We're not shackled by any man's law. And we're not shackled by God's law. Yes, we as believers need to uphold God's moral law. We as believers, we can do that with the help of God, but we're not bound by keeping the law to be saved. And that's what these Galatian believers, well, we're trying to get those who believe by faith to do. So application-wise, I'm wondering what in your minds are shackling you or what in your minds where you are in some ways judging people to say that, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing that. Matthew's Gospel gives us a little bit of insight. It says, do not judge so that you do not, you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We see that the book of Matthew tells us that, you know, we shouldn't be judging and, and you know, um, we shouldn't be shackling people. We can judge people's fruits. That God says we can do. But we can't judge their intentions. Only God can do that. So, if you see people trying to shackle believers, say, where do you find the, in the scriptures that allows you to do that? Yes, we do need to point out people's sin and we need to do it in a manner that, that is uh, worthy. And that, you know, sometimes, we, well, we need to go directly, one-on-one. -on -one. Then we need to go, you know, if that person doesn't listen, then we need to go in couples, just as, uh, or at least two or more. Uh, and then we need to escalate uh, if the person is recalcitrant and not listening. So there is a method that the Bible teaches for those who are living in sin and, and are deliberately sinning before God. We need to definitely tell them that they are sinning before God. But, but outside of moral things, you see, people are free to live the life that they uh, choose to live in Christ. And that's what this text is talking about. And then 
Also, we see in the second half of this great chapter that we are justified by faith, not by the works of the law or faith plus anything else. Because look, if you notice verse 11, it says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed to his face, Cephas is Peter, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew, like, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? So, again, before Peter, before Paul came to Jerusalem, and then before Peter came, the, or, or, the, or the Jews who came, I'm sorry, Peter was fellowshipping with the Gentiles. He was fellowshipping with the Gentiles. He was eating with them because it says, verse 12, for prior to the coming of certain men, prior to some people who visited uh, these Gentile believers where Peter was at, Peter ate with the Gentiles. He communed with them. He and Barnabas communed with them. However, when these Jewish people of certain status came, Peter feared them. It says, fearing the party of the circumcision, he withdrew. Peter withdrew. The text has the implication that they withdrew slowly. Maybe they were eating three meals at a time, but then they started to eat just two meals with the Gentiles. And then they started to eat only one meal with the Gentiles. And then they ultimately not ate with the Gentiles at all. And so Paul addresses this hypocrisy. And he says, you hypocrite, to the face of, of all. You see, the reason for this hypocrisy was not because Peter did not know the theology. His theology did not change. The gospel is by grace to the Jews and Gentiles. The theology is the same. He was motivated by fear. Fear of what these religious Jews would say to Peter. And because of that fear, he became a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is defined this way. Claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. It's a pretense. This is according to Oxford Dictionary. And in the ancient times, you know, the ancient Greek word of hypocrisy um, is a word that used for actors who um, have a mask. So they really have two faces. They, they hide their true feelings with this mask. And so that's the root of hypocrisy, the word hypocrisy from the ancient Greek. And so Peter is acting two-faced here to the Gentiles before the Jews the, of stature, stature came, he ate with the Gentiles. But when the, the Jews came, then he withdrew from them. And I remember when I was first called a hypocrite. I was in elementary school when um, my, one of my best friends, Mike, he, he and I were like, you know, um, bread and butter. We always hung around together, yeah, and so we, I stayed at his house sometimes, and he would stay at my house, so we got to know each other pretty well. And, you know, when he came to our house, of course, um, uh, Mike was an Italian, I'm Korean, you know, that's why I keep saying I'm an Italian, for some of you who, who have heard me say that I'm an Italian. Uh, he has influenced me in a great way, and a great man, um, and so... Mike, knowing me, sometimes, you know, he saw my life and he saw what I said and they didn't match. 
And he said, you're a hypocrite. And that threw me off and I said, what? And, and that shocked me. But as he explained to me what I was doing, you know, that was uh, one of the most important statements that he made to help me to change. God used uh, that friend to help me to see that I was not always consistent with my words and my actions. And so that statement, you're a hypocrite, uh, at first floored me, but it changed me. God used that to change me. And you know, there are hypocrites everywhere. And Jesus addresses these hypocrites in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. There's a whole host of examples, but I'm going to read to you just a few. Jesus is obviously addressing the Pharisees, chapter 23, verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in, in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tied mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithful, faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Basically, Jesus is saying to these hypocrites, these Pharisees, you know, uh, what was just mentioned, mint, dill, and cumin, these are gar garden items. These are plants, um, and they're pretty minor. And so, the Pharisees took these things and whatever they got, they tied these little things. You know, I, I prefer Caesar salad myself, but these guys must have been, you know, liking garden salad. But they, they tied these little things, but they did not focus on the heavier or the weightier, more important matters, which were justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And we see throughout the scriptures that the Pharisees always neglect these important matters. They focus on minor things. So they pick and choose what they want to do. And that's why Jesus calls them a hypocrite. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, First place the, the clean, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. So again, these Pharisees, they uh, clean the outside. They make themselves look good, but inside they're very ugly and dirty. Jesus calls them out. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. So you, to outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So again, on the outside they look righteous, but inward, of course, God knew their hearts and intentions. God said, you know, they were wicked to the core. God called them out. God said, you are hypocrites. So, going back to Galatians, we see that Peter has played the role of a hypocrite. Uh, with the Gentiles, he acted one way. With the Jews, he acted another way. And when these Jews of stature came, he then went to the Gentiles or had these Gentiles then try to live under the law. Paul says, you yourself came out of that. You yourself could not live under the law. You as a Jew could not live under the law. Why is it that then, then you are expecting these Gentiles to live under the law? You hypocrite. And then this is where he talks about justification by faith. Verses 15 and following. If we are Jews by nature, not sinners for, from among the Gentiles, they're still sinners, but they're not sinners like the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but, faith through, but through faith in Christ Jesus, 
even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I die to the law, so that I might live to God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So we are justified by faith. Peter is told by Paul, reminded by Paul that he is justified by faith. Peter knew that. But again, we saw that Peter acted as a hypocrite because of his fear of people. You see, Peter was given a divine revelation by God that he could eat anything. If you look at Acts chapter 9 and 10, you can see that Cornelius, uh, a Gentile, was, was actually a, a, a godly man and he was seeking God and God used Peter. This is Acts chapter 10. God used Peter to, wit to minister to Cornelius. Cornelius had this vision that uh, God uh, acknowledged Cornelius' devoutness to God and uh, how Cornelius honored God. And God uh, said to Cornelius, I'm going to send you Peter. And, and so I want you to do is take these two, take two of your men and go meet Peter. And so in the meantime, um, God spoke with Peter. God said, as Peter was uh, praying and worshiping God, God had this big sheet come down from heaven. And then on the sheet, it had all kinds of creatures, crawling creatures, four-footed creatures. And, and God said to Peter, eat. And, and Peter saw some of these creatures were not... Uh, allowed to, he were not allowed to eat these creatures according to the dietary laws in the Old Testament. And Peter said, Lord, I can't eat. I've never eaten uh, such unholy, unclean animals. But God said, eat. Um, and God said, what God has cleansed no longer considered unholy. And so God spoke to Peter three separate times to, to uh, signify that and emphasize that Peter is now free to eat anything. And Peter got it. If you skip on down to verse 28, he then testifies, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with the foreigner or to visit him. And yet, God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. So from this object lesson of food, he also learned that he can associate with the Gentiles. Peter knew this, but he acted differently. That's a hypocrite. You and I know how to live the Christian life, but we don't always act the way we ought to. So I submit to you, and I can conclude that probably some of us are hypocrites. And so, you know, we need to understand that we don't always come across Christ-like. And you know, one of the major offenses that we give to the non-Christians is our lifestyle. They say, I don't want to go to church. Why? Because the church is full of hypocrites. And are they not telling the truth? They are telling the truth. Sometimes non-believers can see more clearly our lives and our actions than we can see ourselves. Because we're so good at masking who we are that sometimes we forget who we really are. But the non-Christians can see the hypocrisy in that. We live one way, we tell another. You know, I have a friend who tells me that, 
you know, he's having struggles with his Christian life and all that. But whenever he talks to somebody and they, they ask about God, he says he shares the gospel. So his life and his words are not the same. Not that God can't use the gospel. See, that's why the gospel in itself has power. It's not the individual who brings it. It's the, it's the gospel that gives power. But, but, you know, there are hypocrites throughout the church. And I'm wondering if we can ask God to help us to see where our hypocrisy may lie. And ask God to help us so that we can be changed people as we ought. As the word of God says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Why? How? By the renewing of your mind. And how do we do that? The word of God. The word of God is what cleanses us, what renews us. What helps us to think the way God thinks. What helps us to live the way God lives. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 is a practical verse. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. So how is it that we can overcome hypocrisy? How is it that we can overcome the fear of men? Fear of women? Sometimes women are more fearful than men. Uh, or more... No, never mind. <laughs> so... But men or men or women, many times we're influenced by people, right? The text here in verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So what is this essentially saying is that we need to identify, we need to be unified with Christ. We need to be joined with Christ. What did Christ do? He denied himself. He, he died on the cross for your sins and my sins. Jesus said, not my will, Father, but your will. So we as believers, you see, we need to crucify ourselves in a sense that deny ourselves. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, deny yourself daily. So deny the things of the flesh. And yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. So let Christ live in you. Live, uh, you need to appropriate his power. I need to appropriate his power. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. We still live in the flesh. It's not automatic that Christ automatically takes over. And he helps us to live a perfect Christian life. No, we have to day to day, moment by moment, will to submit our will to his will. It is a choice to live the Christian life. Just as it is by faith that we're saved. It is by faith we walk. Day by day, moment by moment. And so God wants us to yield to him. So the life I, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who delivered himself up for me. So folks, in closing, God has given us freedom because of the gospel of Christ. And so we can live within the moral laws. We can live a life of freedom. We're not shackled by anything. It's not faith plus something. And also we are justified by faith and faith alone. So one thing I'd like to ask of all of you, just ask God to help you to see where you are inconsistent with your faith. Where you and I, I'm going to do the same thing. So that we can live a life that's pleasing to God. So that we can not be called hypocrites, but be called Christians with nothing else. I mean, the Christian means little Christ. So we can reflect who Jesus is. Because people are dying left and right. And anyone who is born is going to die. That's a given fact. So the issue is where they go when they die is the issue. You and I, on this side of eternity, can make an influence. So let's live a life of consistency, not a life of hypocrisy in the power of God. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that constantly reminds us how to live a life that's pleasing to you. 
Thank you for each and every brother and sister here, Lord. And, and we, as we reflect, uh, as we reflect who we are, help us to see who we truly are right now and who we truly can become. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.